Hey everyone, I hope you're well. I'm Charting Man Dan of the Chart Guys, full-time trader the last 13 years. We've been running the Chart Guys just about eight years at this point, focusing on technical analysis, trading, and education on those subjects. And we're gonna do some Q&A today, laid back, low-key, Friday, hangout session. I do have a beer, but it's non-alcoholic because I'm going out for drinks later, and if I start now, no chance I'll make it. So I appreciate you all tuning in. Thanks for the likes and the subscribes and the shares as always. That is my motivator to continue making content and interacting with you all. And it certainly makes things more enjoyable when I am interacting with you all versus just staring at the screen of flashing numbers. So before we get into it, we're also going to give away some free courses here in just a bit. But I want to do a poll here. I've never done a poll on a YouTube live stream. So just curious asking how many years you have been trading for. So feel free to respond to that poll. I don't know how you respond, but hopefully you'll figure it out. So let's get into it. I love I love these sessions because it's almost like, you know, I get obviously a ton of questions about trading and technical analysis, but most of it is what do you think of this chart? What does Apple look like? What does Google look like? And that definitely gets monotonous after a while because it's, it's an automatic response for me. I have a system of what I look at. I look at these indicators. I look at this, you know, these price action trends and it's automatic. There's no creativity. And when I get open-ended questions, then it's more of like, you know, hanging out and talking with your friends and being able to elaborate on things. And essentially it's, it's more engaging for my brain and it's more enjoyable to answer those kinds of questions. So I do enjoy these Q&A sessions. So I'm just gonna get right into it. And if you want to ask your questions in the, the YouTube chat room here, that's what I'm gonna be reading and going along with. And I'm going to start it off with Flecky. And he gave three questions. We'll just pick one to start. If I could restart my trading career with the same bankroll and everything, what with what I know now, how would I start, let's see, how would I, yeah, what would I do differently? Honestly, I am, I'm one of the luckiest traders out there. Obviously, I put in a ton of work. I put in my 10,000 plus hours. I've been doing this, you know, I've done some degree of work, seven days a week, 360 days a year for the last decade. And that has allowed for me to, along with luck, perform well as a trader. But I wouldn't change a thing because I would be scared to have any little misstep not lead to how it turned out. And looking back on things, it turned out absolutely perfectly. I could not have hoped for it to turn out any better. And so I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I could look back and say, well, I would wanted to have skipped this big loss. But if I skip that big loss, then I don't carry along that lesson learned into the future. And maybe that big loss in 2012, when my capital, you know, a big loss was $5,000, maybe if I don't get that lesson, then in 2018, that loss and that lesson comes with a $50,000 price tag or something much higher. So I wouldn't change anything about it. And, and that's just because, again, those lessons are so important to learn along the way. We all have to learn those lessons and, and not repeat them. And that's what allows for us to improve as traders. So wouldn't change a thing. <clears throat> Good to see you, Mary and Marshall. What am I having for lunch? Nothing yet. I don't really eat a whole lot during the day. I had a little bar in the morning. All right. Main question from Afro Samurai. Oversold bounces or back burners? How do un... I don't know what that question is. How do you, how do I know when the bottom is in and when it's safe to jump in? Uh, I don't know if that's what the question is asking, but how do I, when I'm playing an oversold bounce, I am either playing a stair step. And if you want to know about how I trade oversold bounces, we have a number of videos that go very in depth into this. There's a, a video about how I trade crypto breakdowns. There's a video about stair step patterns. 
And these are how I trade bounces. Sometimes it's wedges, but it's if it's a stair step trade, you wait till the stair step breaks bullish, you're in your position and you stick your stop under the low. It's a very straightforward, systematic approach. There's different styles of trading. There's systematic where if A happens, you do B, robotic, just very straightforward. And then there's more intuitive where you have more of a feel for the market and you're factoring in other things and it's not so cut and dry with specific levels. And that's my style of trading more than systematic. I have some trade setups that I will treat systematically and stair steps is one of them, but generally I will uh, be, be doing things on the fly, so to speak, just utilizing my experience, utilizing the, the, the backlog of all these thousands of trades that are in my memory and the things that I've learned from them and putting those into play with every single trade that I take. But if you want an in-depth answer of how I play oversold bounces, it's those two videos, stair step and how I trade crypto breakdowns. So just Google chart guys, crypto breakdowns or chart guys stair step and those will come up. Cannabis sector, you know I am, well, I can't, can't even say that I'm bullish cannabis stocks. I know that there will be another hype wave. That's all I know. That's all I can say. There will be another hype wave. There will be some kind of longer term catalyst, whether it's rescheduling, descheduling of cannabis, federal legalization, whatever it is, there will be a catalyst that leads to a euphoria, a short term euphoria opportunity that I will capitalize on. I'm not going to invest in cannabis stocks. I have no interest because that's not where my edge is. My edge is capitalizing on setups as a trader. And so your question is, what is the risk that TLRY or CGC goes bankrupt? It's absolutely a risk. Right now, CGC is in a death spiral with its stock price. And if you Google chart guys dilution, I have a whole video talking about what death spirals look like in the penny stock world and you know how they, how they come about. And so again, my style is very few. The only really investment that I have right now is a long-term crypto no-touch position, mostly of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and a long-term no-touch spy position made up of 500 companies in the S&P 500. Those are the only things that I am willing to treat as an investment because I'm not an investor. I'm a trader. And so I'm not reading the balance sheets and I'm not playing this game that way. There's many different ways to play this game. And that is not one of the ways that I play. So I have no interest in long-term investments in cannabis. Do I create plans for my trades? Sometimes. If it's a, a longer-term setup where it's more of like, you know, Tesla dropping down to 100, just extremes, longer-term setup, or something along those lines, I'll establish a game plan. And I'll write out, you know, I'm looking for entries here and here, and my average cost basis would be this. And so that means my stop is going to go down here. My target will be up here. But if I'm just day trading, it happens so quickly. Again, I'm using that backlog of, of a decade plus experience. And there's not really, I'm not laying things out. I'm very quickly on the fly, you know, okay, this is a head and shoulders pattern shaping up. And I'm looking for hourly consolidation. And I'll be targeting 15 minute EMA 12 for the first partial profit position to take off. And that all happens in the span of, you know, it's almost subconscious at this point where it will take literally seconds to develop that game plan. All right. Bearish reversal pattern on the five minute looking for hourly consolidation. Here's my target. This is where my stop goes. And once you've played a head and shoulders pattern 213 times, and that's not an exaggeration, it's obviously a made up number, but I've traded a head and shoulders setup hundreds of times. And so I know very easily my stop's going to go here. This is going to be a target. And that's where the muscle memory and flow state comes into play. If you're on your 14th head and shoulders pattern play, you're going to be way less comfortable. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to not know things in terms of that. It's not going to come to you that quickly, nor should you expect it to. So again, you have to remind yourself that when you are, let's check our poll results here real quick. But if you are in your first few years of trading, let's see, we've got 17% in their first year, 19% in their first two years, 33% in their first three years, 
and 30% for plus years of trading. So if you're in your first year or two of trading, you should not expect to be trading like me or like people that have been doing it for so long. Just keep reminding yourself that because you're going to get frustrated. Oh, it looks so easy when Dan does it. And you have to remember, I've literally done it 20 times more than you. So you can get to that point over time and then you will look that way to someone in their first year of trading, but don't be hard on yourself. That's where forgiveness comes into play. Chart Guys Lamont talked about, you know, being forgiving of yourself for things. And that's one of them. If you are newer, it should take you a bunch of trial and error to be able to get extremely comfortable with all these different patterns and setups. Have I ever struggled with starting or maintaining a consistent routine while I started out? And methods that I have found useful when implementing new routines. So I would say I've, I am a very routine oriented person. When I was growing up, you know, middle school element or, um, yeah, middle school into high school, um, you know, my, my grandfather was, was in the military and I, I was, there was a point in time where I actually considered going to uh, a military college really early on, probably, you know, late middle school. It never materialized, but it was because I was so good at routines and, and timing and discipline that, you know, my parents were like, you know, if, if you wanted to, that would be a, a pretty solid route. You would, you would perform well in that kind of environment. And so that's, you know, a personality trait that has benefited me as a trader, just already being like that. Um, so when I develop a new routine, it's pretty easy for me to jump right into it and to then stick with it. So I would say, no, I have not really struggled with starting or maintaining a consistent routine while I was starting out with trading. Because once I set my mind on something, that's it. Like I'm going to do this to the best of my abilities. And so if part of that is waking up at 6 a.m. every day, if I'm going to do it to the best of my abilities, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. every day. And if I'm not, then I'm not doing it to the best of my abilities. And I feel very off. It's something is very wrong. So it's, it's just sticking with that mindset of if I'm going to do something, I'm going to try my hardest. There is, there's no such thing as, you know, half trying in my world with anything. And so that's something that um, can be a negative at times because it's hard to find the off switch with things, but you need to treat, treat it extremely seriously. I mean, not like your life depends on it, but you know, like your future depends on it. If you want this goal, your future depends on whether or not you're going to try your absolute hardest to accomplish that goal. How do I track all of my trades for tax purposes? So it's easy with stocks. My broker does it. You know, they just spit out my broker statements. And so they'll give me a CSV file or a, a PDF file, both of them. And so it's very straightforward. They, they keep track of everything for me. With crypto, I use a third party. I think it's cointracking.info is what I've been using over the years. And I just import all of my thousands of trades in crypto into cointracking.info and then they spit out the report. And then that's the report that I send to the IRS. Sometimes that it's, you know, 200 pages long, but um, just using, using services that compile this information. What's my opinion on gold and the dollar? So I didn't like the fact, and this, you know, I don't really want to talk about individual setups right now, but this I can tie into the bigger picture psychologically. So I made a post May 4th. So that was what? Last Thursday. Because I liked the technical setups of gold and silver. I liked the weekly bull flags. I liked gold right at all time highs. And, you know, I had a thought. Just, just scrolling through Twitter, there is information that you can get from, you know, treating it like this is retail's mindset. And so I said, you know, I really wish there were a lot more bears on this thing because I have not seen any metal bears. It's all bull, 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 bull. And that makes me feel like everybody's on one side of the boat. And when that happens, the boat generally flips. I never want to be in a trade where everybody's looking in the same direction. I have to have people that are counter 
the direction that I'm looking, if I'm going to be comfortable looking in that direction, because that the people that are wrong in the market are going to be the people that help fuel that move. So if I have people that are, you know, a lot of people are bearish the metals, then if we break resistance, those are the people that are going to stop out as shorts and help fuel the move higher. If there's nobody bearish, you reach a point where everybody that's going to go long has gone long. Everybody that's going to stop out of a short has done so. Who's left to buy? And so we temporarily had saw that happen. Silver dumped yesterday and into today. And that was the bull exhaustion. Nobody was left to buy and everybody was bullish and we rolled over. I'm looking for a longer term dollar four month higher low. And I believe when that is set, it will mark four month lower highs in a lot of stocks and ETFs. And so the bounce off of our base of support that the dollar just saw is the first step towards that long-term higher low trying to form. There's still a ton of proving that has to be done from the dollar bulls. But I know big picture, this is a long-term setup that I'm watching for. And it is absolutely notable to me that the dollar bulls are holding this base of support. And so, you know, longer term, this definitely shifts my perspective on the metals. Gold is still holding on pretty well, but when the dollar forms a longer term, higher low, that is going to be uh, bearish for the metals. It's just a question of when does that happen? Because for me, it's the most likely scenario. There's a lot of space for that four month higher low to form. How do I deal with my emotions on a daily basis with regards to trading, especially when you have consecutive red days? So again, this is another one where in your first year or two, constant struggles. When you're on year eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, it doesn't, it, it's not a thing. So I don't feel my emotions on a daily basis regarding my trading. Uh, a bunch of green days in a row, a bunch of red days in a row, uh, it doesn't really have a much of an impact just because again, when you've done something so many times, you just get so used to it. So 13 years into trading, how many times do you think I've had a three-day green streak and a three-day red streak. At this point, we're talking hundreds of times. It's happened hundreds of times. Well, at least a hundred times. And so you get extremely used to it. In the beginning, it requires a lot of work. It requires taking steps back after a number of losses. Again, the analogy I always give now that it's basketball playoff season is you can see the momentum in basketball so easily. A team can be on a, a 10-0 run and then the other team gets a steal and then they go on a 10-0 run. And the, the coaches will call a timeout to stop momentum of the other team. And so you have to do that with trading. If you have three red days in a row, you call a timeout because what you're doing is not working and you take a step back and you take a day off and you reassess things. Okay, what have I been doing that has not been working? What do I need to change about what I'm doing right now? Should I size down my positions until I get more comfortable and get my flow back? If you're feeling emotions during the trading day, you will. You will be feeling emotions during the trading day. Again, I at this point, it's very, very minimal. But in the first few years, you're going to feel them significantly. And you have to recognize them. The people that you know have big red days that, that give back a month worth of gains, they're not checking themselves midday. The bell will ring at the end of the day and they'll say, oh my God, what have I done? How did I do that? My, it's like my brain shut off. It's like I was a deer in the headlights and I completely lost control. But if you are constantly keeping tabs on yourself and it can even be, you know, put a little clock, an alarm that sets off every hour. And every time that alarm goes off, that's your reminder. Okay, step back, reassess things. How's the day going? Am I trading well? Am I making mistakes? Should I be stopping right now? And that's why, you know, some traders say, oh, I don't like having a, a day loser or a day maker level, a day goal, essentially, because it might, you know, limit the, the setups or put pressure on myself. I like it because it's my clear stop sign. If I hit a certain size loss on the day, it's clear you don't have it today. Come back tomorrow. The market will be here tomorrow. You lost, you lost for today. And that's going to happen a ton. And there's nothing wrong with losing for the day. So you accept that loss, you reassess, and you come back. I need to sell a little bounce position real quick.
Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. So again, you should, again, you look at someone like me. It's like, oh, he's so unemotional. A, a, a comment I'll often get when I'm live streaming during a really volatile day. You're so calm. It's, you know, it's just, it's as if nothing's happening. And again, it's just, well, I've seen this literally hundreds of times. And so if you've only seen it eight times, you're going to be feeling these emotions. So don't be, don't beat up on yourself. Oh, I shouldn't be feeling these emotion, emotions. You should be feeling the emotions, but you should be able to recognize that you're feeling these emotions. Again, it's the same thing like if you're in traffic and you, you look over at the dude who is banging his steering wheel and yelling and honking his horn. That person, and you might be feeling frustrated and impatient too, but you can zoom out and say, I'm feeling frustrated right now. And that's okay. I'm in traffic. I'd rather be doing other things. This will pass, blah, blah, blah. And that individual has completely lost control of their emotions and they are not recognizing that they have completely lost control of their emotions. So again, that's the kind of person that gives back a month worth of gains in one day and then after the fact reflects back on their actions. You wanna be reflecting on your actions as they are happening. And that's, that's why it's so important to zoom out and observe yourself. Not necessarily you know, from a third person zoom out and I'm looking at the top of my head sitting on the computer, but in my brain, what's going on in my brain? There's so much inner chatter going on in there and you can observe the inner chatter. It's almost like there's you and your body, there's the voice in your brain, and then there's something else that allows you to observe the voice in your brain. And so that's the voice that you wanna constantly be keeping in check. What is my most controversial opinion? Oh, geez. So the, the most controversial, let's see, a lot of people didn't like when I said that we should be encouraging women to get into crypto because it was definitely, I mean, this was back in 2017. It was all bros. People didn't like that on Twitter. Um, I'd say recently, the whole Elon Musk population thing. Um, I don't think a decline in population is a terrible thing. He paints it as civilization is going to be done. And I paint it as civilization is going to change as it has throughout history as we should expect it to. It always does. Populations always go through boom and bust cycles. So I don't think having the end of globalization and massive growth is the end of civilization. I don't think it would be a terrible thing to go back to smaller communities and be self-reliant on farming and to not have this globalized world. I'm not saying we need to change it, but if it changes, I don't think it's the end of civilization. You know, yes, we're in a world where everybody gets their Apple iPhone from around the world. And yes, in the future, if that's not a thing, I don't think it's the worst case scenario. Am I getting used to holding more long-term? I am, definitely. It still takes a lot of adjusting. Being a, a day trader and being used to being constantly in out. I still struggle. I had this thought today. I still struggle with day trading well. You know, I'll have a green day day trading. I'll, have, I'll do everything right on the day and I'll have a red day in my total aggregate accounts because of my long-term no-touch positions. And I really dislike that. It's like, man, I did everything right and I still had a little bit of a drop in my net worth. And that definitely takes getting used to because again, if I'm going to hold long-term positions and I do want to hold positions for decades because I've seen what it does for other generations that hold things for 30 years, uh, but it does take, it takes a, a certain amount of letting go, letting, letting go of that control, that complete control. <clears throat> What time frames do I use on the stair step? I use them on all time frames. Um, the longer term ones, I think, have a little bit higher win rate as far as follow through. So, like, a, a, the example I give is I just traded a, a JNJ weekly stair step drop a few months ago, and then it led to multiple months of bounce. But I can, I'll use it on the two minute time frame, the five minute, I'll use it on every single time frame but you wanna make sure that there's a bunch of candles. The ideal scenario is that the stair step drop is leading to 
a longer term higher low. And so the longer term most likely scenario is a higher low and then you get the stair step drop and when it breaks, that's the potential of marking that longer term higher low. Just like a back burner is the bounce is the potential for marking that longer term higher low. What program do I use to trade? I trade on Fidelity, Active Trader Pro for stocks. I'm still on Coinbase for crypto. I've been trading crypto the least this year in, in my entire six years of trading crypto. And that's because of fees and uh, the opportunity just, again, there's been years where the, the volatility seen in crypto was not present in any other market. And that's not the case right now. Yes, crypto is very volatile, but that volatility of most of the major altcoins and of crypto are matched by, you know, the stocks that I trade, whether it's the crypto stocks themselves, you know, the leverage ETFs of the biotech sector, these AI plays, which have had crazy volatility. So I need the, the crypto market to show me that there is opportunity there that is not present in other markets for me to focus 100% on it. And I have not focused 100% on crypto in a few years because that's been the case. It, that, that, you know, markets had provided just as much opportunity. You look at the move Bitcoin made, even on the run up to all time high of 69,000, uh, there were plenty of stocks that ran thousands of percent during the same period of time when we were in the maximum euphoria growth names. The, the growth names were a bubble. They've now popped and pulled back 70 to 85%, just like crypto has done many times, but they had the same gains on the way up as Bitcoin did. 2017 was unique. 2017 crypto, those opportunities were not present even close in any other market. So that's what determines where I'm focusing. Where is the opportunity? Where is the opportunity where it is not present elsewhere? And crypto has not had an opportunity that is not present in stocks in a while. I mean, you get these meme coins like Pepe, but that's not enough for me. With all the different markets out there and indicators. I lost the question. Wow, we got a lot of questions. Thanks everyone. With all the different markets to trade and all the different strategies, it can be difficult to narrow focus. If starting today, what market or strategy should beginners focus on? So I, I mean, the good question. I would say equilibriums because they are the most common pattern on all kinds of time frames in all kinds of markets. Focus on the equilibrium pattern, either first just observing it and recognizing when the equilibrium is the most likely scenario. Then you can graduate to trying to trade within the equilibrium or you can just trade the breaks of the equilibrium and tightening ranges. But first step is observing and recognizing them and getting good at saying, this is likely going to form a tightening range. I mean, that's what I did with Bitcoin. We did the live stream on Wednesday. So, all right, Bitcoin just dumped big, but it's had a big bounce. Scout the hourly equilibrium. And lo and behold, a beautiful hourly equilibrium shapes up over the next six hours. And so when you, when you are able to recognize the most likely scenario is an equilibrium, it then, that lays out the framework of establishing your trade setups. All right, I'm going to scout the lower high. And then once it's set, I'm going to scout the higher low. And you can just practice. I mean, one equilibrium can give you practice scouting the lower high, zooming in to find a bearish pattern to show you that the lower high is forming. And then scouting the higher low, zooming in to find the bullish pattern that lets you know that that's most likely forming. Watching what the volume is doing on the constricting ranges, generally declining. Once the break happens, watching the increase in volume. Do we break multiple levels? Do we only break one level and not follow through? Observation, again, I keep talking about the library I have in my head of 13 years of trading and 8,000 equilibrium setups. And you get that through observation. And there is no shortcut to those observations. You have to observe them. There is no shortcut in trading to time in front of the screen and watching how price action plays out. I don't care if you're, you've got a mentor with the best indicator, and the, the, the whatever, you have to put in 
the hundreds or thousands of hours watching price action. That's the baseline of all successful traders. There aren't any successful traders that haven't done that. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, the one great thing about the internet and social media is there is this, I mean, it's, it's hard to sift through who's legit and who's not, but there, is, there are a bunch of really good traders that are sharing information and sharing their experiences. So if I look at all these professional traders and every single one of them is using a stop loss and every single one of them is doing this and doing this, well, shoot, emulate them, do what they're doing. There are people that will say, well, I don't use a stop loss because I don't want to get wicked out. If you don't know any professional traders that do not use a stop loss, why in the world would you not use a stop loss? It doesn't make any sense. Does my trading strategy work with prop firm trading rules? I'm not sure. I've never tried prop trading. I was fortunate enough to level up my capital thanks to crypto. So I've never sought uh, outside capital for my trading and I never will. Um, I like to be, I mean, the whole point of being a trader was to be in charge. You know, people ask why, you know, if you're a successful trader, why aren't you trading for XYZ company? Because I like being my boss. I like answering to no one. I like zero pressure to perform. I like everything being reliant on me. And so I will never be a prop trader. And that's the reason why. But again, it required lucking out by falling into a thousands of percent bull market that allowed for, you know, 10xing the account to then have the capital to not need funding. So I'll never look at a trader and say, oh, you know, you should build your own capital. You shouldn't try and, and do prop trading because uh, that's, you know, easy to easy for me to say. I got a, a once in a lifetime, I won't say once in a lifetime, but I got a, a significant opportunity that I fortunately capitalized on. But, you know, right now in this market, that opportunity doesn't exist. So easy, easy to say in hindsight. Do I know any traders that are profitable in trading 100 times leverage? Uh, not consistent, consistently, but I also, you know, haven't been asking around. I've definitely seen some trades that have worked with it, but leverage is tricky. So similar to, you know, prop trading, leverage is tricky in the sense that the only people that should be trading with any kind of leverage, significant leverage, are people that are experienced with many years of trading. And generally, it's the people that have experienced with many years of trading that are doing well and uh, may not need that extra capital. And it's the people that are just starting out that say, oh, my capital is so small. I'm looking at this social media account and he's making $5,000 a trade and I only have $5,000 to trade with. I need to trade with leverage so I can be like that person. That's a recipe for you're going to blow up your account and you're not going to be in this game long term. It's almost a guarantee. I mean, it's a 95% chance that that's what's going to happen. You cannot successfully trade with leverage until you've taken all the lessons, made all the mistakes, learned all the rules, put in the hundreds of hours, thousands of hours watching price action. It's almost like just trying to skip the line and you can't skip the line with trading. So I would say, do not trade with leverage if you are in your first three years of trading. Just a simple, clear rule. Year one and two, your job is to survive. I shudder to think what would have happened if I lost, if I lost my $3,000 that I started with, I would be, I would not be a trader right now. It's just so easy. It's such a fine line where one event can take you out of this game forever and not, and, and cut off the road of the potential of what could have been. And that's why capital preservation is the most important aspect. Stay in the game. Allow yourself to experience those thousands of hours of observation, to build up the library, to increase your skill set. When I go long or short for a day trade, how far in the money? I don't trade options. I used to. And when I did day trade options, uh, I would go 
pretty much I would stay one strike price in the money or out of the money. I would not go much farther than that. Do I invest in any real estate? Yes. Another, you know, luck. It's the kind of thing where, you know, I've been lucky so many times. I'm the luckiest person alive. And a lot of that has to do with mindset and energetic approach to life, in my opinion. Calling in the things in the right time. I mean, you know, I look back at the, the crypto boom in 2017 that helped change my life in, in terms of capital and uh, trading. And, you know, I was calling it in. I was in the hot tub visualizing this is going to happen. This Ethereum is going to go another 100% from all time highs. That's going to give me the down payment for the house. I'm going to do this and execute this way and just laying it all out in advance. And then it happens 10 times better than ever could have anticipated. And then with real estate, you know, okay, I want to I want to make an investment in real estate and and can I time the market? No, I I don't have any confidence in my ability to time the market. Things seem a little overbought right now, but I don't have any confidence in my ability to time the market. So I buy right before COVID and then the price of the house shoots up 50% in a year and a half. And so I luck out in a big way, but again, it's also you know, if I had decided, well, I'm going to try and time this market and wait for a pullback, I would have missed that opportunity. So it's, it's a lot of luck, but in my opinion, luck definitely can be controlled to a certain degree by our mindset, approach, energetic, lifestyle, etc. You know, if I was in a negative place, uh, crypto is not going to break out and I might lose all this money and I focused on that negative aspect of things. In my opinion, it would have turned out very differently. Mindset is so important. When when I use a medium position size, what's the minimum percentage gain that I call a day maker? So that's very subjective. My day maker level has changed over the years. Six years ago, my day maker was 10% what it is right now. And so back then, a day maker was maybe... 0.8% of my account. And now a day maker is 0.1% of my account or something along those lines. So it's very subjective in terms of, you know, percentage. Um, and also the number one determining factor of what determines my position size on a trade is my confidence level. Have I traded this ticker a lot? Am I confident in the setup? What's the volatility of the ticker like? If it's more volatile, I'm going to use a smaller position size. If it's less volatile, I'm going to use a larger position size. The position size that I'll take on Apple is going to be three times larger than a position size I'll take on Riot, the crypto stock, which is way more volatile. So position size, these three things, position size is based on familiarity with the trading instrument, confidence in the specific setup that I'm trading on, and volatility of the instrument that I'm trading. All right, let's talk about free courses for a bit here before we get back into it. I'm going to do another 20 minutes. We'll end at 1 p.m. So free courses is not an easy way for me to communicate with you all on YouTube. They made it so you can't really message people on YouTube anymore, which does make it a bit tricky. But once this live stream is completed, if you go to the video on our YouTube channel, you know, right now you're all talking in the chat. And then once it's done, you can leave comments on the video. And so if you leave a comment on the video, that's how I'm going to choose the winners. And then I will message you from there or respond to you from there. Um, but I will choose one person randomly and two people... Uh, based on responses. So when we're done, go to the YouTube and I'll wait, you know, until the weekend, end of the weekend before I pick a winner. But we'll give away some free courses to those that comment on this video. And then I will reach out to you from there. When do I realistically think cannabis could get legalized on a federal level? That's a fool's game to try and guess. Again, that's you know, what, what is the probability that I can time the housing market? Zero. I have no confidence in my ability to time the housing market. I have no confidence in my ability to time government decisions on any, anything, 
let alone cannabis. And anybody that has tried in the last decade is not having a good time. Again, there's, I live my life by probabilities in every, in every way. I don't like going near the edges of cliffs and I don't like shooting guns because in those moments, the probabilities for me dying are highest and I'm having a good time. I'm not ready to die just yet. So with trading, it's all probabilities. What's a high probability setup? What's a low probability setup? Every decision I make is probabilities. So what's the probability that I can time federal change in cannabis? It is so low, I know it might as well be zero. What's the probability that I can, you know, guess what an earnings reaction is going to be? 50-50. I have no edge there. If you do not have an edge, do not put your money in play. Otherwise, go to Vegas. You don't have an edge in Vegas. Gamble there. If I'm gambling my money and trading is gambling, it's gambling with an edge. I have to have an edge if my money is going to be in play. Is it productive to just watch the market, seeing how things play out? Absolutely, you're racking up the hours. Is it productive to throw a tennis ball against the wall if you want to be a baseball player? Absolutely. You're putting in the time, you're making observations, you're making mental notes, you're practicing picking out patterns, you're watching how price action trades. Imagine the market is a, a living organism and you're observing it. Same thing if it's an animal. You know, if I want to be an expert on geese, I'm going to observe the geese. I'm going to sit out and watch how they interact all morning. And I'm going to learn a lot about them. Observe the market as much as possible. How much of my portfolio is in other countries, in cash or in gold with all this uncertainty? Uh, I've got it split up. You know, I've got my crypto. I've got my metals. Cash, I'm always cash is king just in terms of the maneuverability and agility that that allows. And just in terms of being able to put it in different places. You know, if there's a real estate collapse, I want to have a bunch of cash where I can take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, if the dollar collapses, I want to move my cash into things that are not collapsing. So for me, the lifeboat is the dollar. Maybe that changes someday, but it's not changing right now. And that's the starting point. If I'm in the dollar, I can move very quickly to all these other things. And so that was the case during the CVID dump where I went into a lot of cash. And that was just me protecting. Okay, let's see where, how this plays out. You know, if, if, if the dollar starts to see significant red flags of me having my capital in dollars, then I'll go into something else, whether it's Bitcoin or metals or whatever. But in terms of, again, I just always want to be agile and able to maneuver. And so there's pluses and benefits to all different kinds of asset classes. Real estate investment, you know, long-term history, great. But it's not liquid. If I need to move my, the net worth of, of a house fast, that's very difficult to do. It's like the broader market bears are keeping control most of the day today. Three hours left to go. It might, it might stay a trending day here. We did break support in the S&P 500. How do I describe my profession as a trader to new people I meet? Um, I just say I'm a trader. Sometimes there's assumptions that come along with that. Um, you know, I went to a bar years ago and the drunk gal was, oh, so you, you just, I mean, if you say you're a trader, the assumption is that you have money, um, which is only true part of the time. I like flying under the radar, which is why I don't do 
you know, the flashy car and things like that. I have friends that I've been hanging out with for eight years that don't know I have any money. To them, I'm just one of the hippies. And I like it that way a lot. Um, but I just say, trade. I don't really elaborate on it much. If the person's interested, I'll talk about it, sure. But it's usually just one sentence. Like, I'm a trader, stocks and crypto. And then, cool, move on. Most people aren't interested. Is being a good long-term investor inconsistent with being a good trader? No, you can definitely be both. It's usually one or the other because you've got to focus on one as your main thing. Uh, it's difficult to change those mindsets up, which is, you know, I've been practicing for years, shifting my day trading mindset to more longer-term perspective. And someone whose long-term perspective is going to have a hell of a time going into, you know, micro moves day trading or even short-term swing trading. It's hard for the brain to adjust. It's like, it's like viewing the entire game through a different lens. It's like switching, you know, I always go to the sports analogies, but it's like, you know, you're, you're a, a f offensive football player and now you're on defense. It's a completely different game. It's the same game, but it's completely different. So Greg says, I suck at routines. You suck at routines because you have it set in your mind that you suck at routines. The only thing that is keeping you sucking at routines is yourself. If you can flip that switch, if you can find the switch in there and say, I'm sick of sucking at routines. I'm about to be really good at routines. There is absolutely nothing that is saying you can't do that. It is 100% a mental wall that you have put up and it's a story that you tell yourself and you've attached to that story. It's the same thing. I'm the lucky, I'm the most unlucky person in the world. Uh, nothing good ever happens to me. If you're in that mindset, I promise it will stay that way. You've got to mix things up and you've got to get out of that, that story and that narrative that you've created for yourself. There is nothing physically or, or about your brain that is preventing you from being good at routines. What advice would I give to somebody one to two years in, given the market and current conditions versus my success with MJ and crypto? So my success with MJ and crypto 2017 and 2018 was seven and eight years into my trading. So that means there was a whole lot of patience and I wasn't changing my life for seven to eight years with trading. I was getting by. I was making enough to live the lifestyle that I wanted, which was a very minimalistic hippie lifestyle. And then seven years in, the opportunity presented itself. So if you're in year one or two, that means if your story is going to be the same as mine, in 2028, you're going to get your opportunity. How wild is that to think about? Why can't that happen in 2028? Maybe there's going to be a boom in quantum computing stocks that allows for a massive opportunity. Who knows? But that's, if, if we're comparing and if your story were going to be the same as mine, it's 2028. So the, the, the takeaway is preserve your capital. Preserve your capital and ensure that you are in the game when that opportunity presents itself. What's the best way to learn about probabilities? That's a good question. I mean, I took, I took a statistics course in college, which probably had a good bit to do with it. I mean, any, any course that I took in college, you can now take online, of course. So you've got, uh, I mean, all the, I would say statistics. I mean, there's probably courses about probabilities. Logic, logic is all if then statements. And I use those a lot in my trading. So I took a logic course with a crazy teacher in college. Statistics, I'd say those are two that aren't markets related that are absolutely applicable to markets.
What non-alcoholic beers? This, whatever this, this one's really good. They've gotten really good over the last few years. Athletic Brewing, IPA. Uh, it's good. I would suggest it. Do I ever trade SQQQ? Yes. If I'm trading QQQ bearish, I'm doing it through SQQQ. What price would Bitcoin need to hit for me to sell my no touch positions? For me, by definition, no touch means no touch. I will hold it to zero. It's zero dollars in my brain. What is, how much of my net worth is in Bitcoin? Zero dollars. For it to be a no touch position, I have already mentally and emotionally accepted it's worth zero. I will ride it to zero. The only reason that I held it from 3,000 to 69,000 is because that was my mindset. Charman, if you look at the most recent day in a life video that I did, it'll answer a lot of your questions. So with, with questions about routine and anything like that, watch the day in a life video that's fairly recent. Again, watch, go to our YouTube channel and go through the psychology and lifestyle playlist. And there's a lot in there that is useful. Do I take revenge trades? It definitely happens. But generally, I'll recognize this is a revenge trade and I shouldn't take it. So again, it's, it's not that I don't feel the urge to take a revenge trade. It's that I feel the urge to take a revenge trade. I recognize that I'm feeling that urge and then I don't act on it. That's the difference between an experienced trader and a new trader. It's not that you know, you're, you're feeling like taking a revenge trade. That's bad. I shouldn't be feeling this way. I feel it. I just don't act on it. Who taught me to trade? How did I learn? What resources? So I was on iHub, Investors Hub, and there was an individual, Osprey on there who was doing technical analysis, Bollinger Bands, RSI, and I asked a bunch of questions, but it was a lot of observing what he was doing and then just doing my own research on uh, YouTube. And I mean, there wasn't much on YouTube but articles and things like that. Investopedia, those kinds of websites. Okay, he, he talks about the RSI a lot. I'm going to research the RSI for the next few days. I'm going to observe the RSI for the next few months. And so it was a lot of, essentially he would point at something and then I go out on my own and then devote a significant amount of time focusing on that thing that he just pointed to. I've never read a book about trading and that's not, you know, a flex. It's just not my learning style. I was all online, Google. So if you need someone to physically tackle you, if you have three red days in a row, that's something to work on for sure. We have, we have to remember, not only is this gambling, this is an addiction. It's extremely easy to get addicted to this game because you are constantly feeling drips of dopamine in your brain as you play it. So you have to ensure that you are not falling into addiction. You have to prove to yourself, I can take a day off. And I, I struggle with this as well. Because it's become, it's ingrained in my DNA to come online and check Twitter. I mean, my routine is so ingrained in my DNA that to break it, it's extremely difficult to do. But I have to force myself to do that every now and again so I don't go insane and so I don't lose control. How do I foresee the future of trading? changing over the next five years. So again, that's another one. What's the probability that I'm going to be able to determine accurately what trading will be like in five years? Extremely low. So I don't put much time into it. 
Are things gonna change? Absolutely. Things have been changing my entire trading career. Twitter influences markets way more since Trump than it did when I first started trading. I wasn't on Twitter my first five years of trading. But then I realized I need to be paying attention to this because it is moving trillions of dollars in this market. There was one example, I think it was either 2016, I think it was 2016, oil was dumping and there was a tweet that was put out and that marked the bottom for oil and the bottom for the markets and we V-shaped. And I was like, wow, that tweet literally moved trillions of dollars. And that's when I realized, okay, the game is different. And with AI and quantum computing, it's, it's only gonna change more and more. And so will technical analysis still work? There will be some version that still works. You know, if a, a supercomputer bot is gonna be making money, I can ride the coattails of that supercomputer bot. I mean, that's the approach that I've taken with trading. It's I'm just riding the coattails of big money. I'm recognizing what big money is doing and I'm looking to follow along and pick up the crumbs along the way. So whether that's individual traders with $100 million or whether it's an algo or whether it's an AI bot, whatever it's gonna be, I can still recognize things on the charts that allow me to follow along. Do you use the order book in trading? I used to with level two in penny stocks and with crypto in 2017. And I don't anymore because I'm trading stocks where you need many millions of dollars to make an impact on level two. And crypto is a lot more liquid than it was. So the order books are a lot less influential. Not to say that it's not worth doing. I know that it's definitely... You know, there's people that are, that's a significant aspect of their trading strategy, but I shifted away from it to focus more on just the pure price action. Why don't I raise chickens? I've raised chickens many times in my life, but... I want to be able to travel easily and freely and not have to worry about taking care of them. There's also a lot of hawks in this area and I've had plenty of baby chickens die in my hands. I don't feel like doing that right now. With my long-term no-touch crypto, I am 100% allocated. It was from 2017, 2018. I will not put any more capital towards that. It is what it is. When was my last red month? I have I have plenty of red months. Um, this bear market to end last year definitely had some red months. Yeah, I'd probably say maybe November of last year. It's definitely, I've never been in a real bear market. You know, I've been in a crypto bear market. I've been in a cannabis bear market. I've never been in a broader market bear market. And so this has been a lot of observing for me. My trading has slowed down and I am doing a lot of observing, knowing that I will use this historical inf observation and information the next bear market, whether that's in two years, seven years, whatever. So I'm no, I'm going into it, knowing I've never experienced something like this, I knew chill out and observe because the first time you experience anything is not the time to capitalize on it. And that's the same thing with crypto. We had plenty of chart guys members who in 2017 made a bunch in 2018, 19 gave it all back. Then they had the experience and they did it again in 2022, but they didn't give it back. Same thing with me. I did it in penny stocks, 400% up. I'm a genius. Give it all back. And that's the only reason because I had that lesson from 2012 or whenever it was that I didn't do it in crypto, that I didn't do it in cannabis. That was a differentiator for me. I don't stand out because I made money during those markets. I stand out because I kept it. And the only reason I kept it is because I learned that lesson in penny stocks in my first couple years of trading.
And so being eight years into my journey at that point, I had those experiences to protect me. All right, we're going to do two more. How much can I squat? Well, this, this one doesn't count. How much can I squat, bench, and deadlift? Honestly, I have no idea. I work out. I go to the gym every now and again, but I care more about, you know, how many, how many, how many feet of a row can I hoe? How many five-gallon buckets of water can I lift? That's the stuff that I care about. Anytime I'm in the gym lifting, picking up metal and putting it down, man, this is the most useless input of energy. Yeah, I'm getting something out of it, but I would so much rather be working out and being productive at the same time. So like I can be shopping and have a, a big bag, you know, as I'm walking through the aisle, crunching that bag is just so much more useful to me. Or, you know, wheelbarrowing mulch. I'm accomplishing something and I'm working out. I have a, I have a really hard time with picking up metal and putting it down. What in the world am I doing? <clears throat> I have played some pickleball. Not a lot, but it's fun. I drive a Toyota RAV4. I don't care at all about cars. Level two, we just answered it. Can I talk about what becoming a members offers users? Again, we've got entire videos going over everything. So if you look at, go on our YouTube channel, it's all there. The, there's there's, there's 8,000 videos there. So I understand it can be overwhelming, but that's why there's the playlists. If you click the playlist, it's you know much less, much fewer videos. And so right on the main page of our YouTube, we've got you know talking about the Chart Guys trading community and a video in depth talking about everything that that entails. So I can't stress enough. I mean, I know everybody, it's easy to consume content when it's shoved into your face, whether it's the YouTube algos telling you to watch this or whatever, but on your own, go to our YouTube channel. I mean, you can literally go back in time and watch a video that I made six years ago. How was Dan acting when you go on the chart, Bitcoin is dumping 30% and then search the, the date of that video and you can find, you know, how was I reacting then? What was I looking for? My observations. That's one way to utilize our 8,000 videos of content. But the other way, the evergreen videos and evergreen just means that it's not, you know, that they're always useful. It's not just in the moment price action. Uh, there are hundreds of them. It's just, it's worth putting the time in. So I talked about, you know, how it would go on Investopedia and I'll go on Google to look things up. I mean, make part of your routine, your educational routine. I'm going to go on the Chart Guys YouTube channel and just explore these playlists for an hour and see what kind of content, what the what different kinds of videos there are. I mean, that's, that's a part of the educational routine that, I mean, it's right there. That library is right there for the taking. It's going to be really weird when I'm dead and my entire life is on YouTube. What's the minimum amount of cash required for day trading? So you know you need $25,000, say the federal government, uh, to be able to be an actual day trader. You can get around that by being a futures trader or trading options. But I started with $3,000. I was swing trading at that point. And I added money along the way. It's not like everything I have is from $3,000. You know, I would win a poker tournament or I would save up some money from doing yard work and I would add it to my account. And that was my goal back in high school. I mean, it started with high school job money. I then added college job money. And my goal was just add as much money into my trading account as possible. Through side hustles. I was exploring trading in my first three years and I was painting houses and doing yard work and adding that capital into the account. Camp counselor, I was a lobster fisherman in 10th grade. That was my first experience in entrepreneurship. 
When do I do live seminars? All the time. Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning. And other than that, it's all the Chart Guys team that I have mentored and that have spread their own wings. And they're doing Tuesday afternoon. I mean, we live stream three times every day at least. All right, one more. One more trading and one more life. We got a video on lucid dreaming. Chart guys, lucid dreaming. What impact has it had on my trading and overall life skills? That's a very in-depth, tricky one. Intangible, subconscious. Hard for me to put into words, but definitely very meaningful. Control. When I realized that I could control my dreams and do whatever I wanted in them, and then I realized the dream world is so similar to real world, I believe that that had a major impact with the uh, recognition of, I can control a lot of this reality with my brain as well. And that goes back to the energetics and the mindset kind of things. There is so much about that aspect of our lives and reality that science does not understand. Science does not understand lucid dreaming. Science does not understand the dreaming world. Science does not understand why we sleep. Science does not understand gravity. That one doesn't really fit in, but there's so much about this experience that we have that is unable to be explained by science. So we need to be open to all kinds of things. And for me, I can significantly control the external reality around me with my brain and mindset. And living my life that way for over the last 10 plus years has been very meaningful. And without a doubt, I do believe that that has influenced my success as a trader. Do I think that I made the crypto boom happen in 2017? No, but I think that I made my success happen by visualizing it in advance. Kind of music, I'm into the funk. Give me a saxophone and a bass line. How to start gardening, that's a good one. Again, YouTube has everything you would ever wanna know about how to start gardening, but a mentor. So find someone who loves gardening and offer to weed their garden with them and they will just spit information at you. I mean, I could walk around my gardens and just, I mean, the amount of built up knowledge over time from experiences, mistakes. I made so many mistakes as a gardener growing plants and you learn from it and you don't repeat them. It's the same thing as trading. Good source to learn about lucid dreaming. Again, go to the psychology of a trader video that I made and I talk about books that changed my life that aren't relating to trading, that helped me as a trader and there's two lucid dreaming books in there. Lucid dreaming, gateway to the inner self. Psychology of a trader video. Awesome, William, glad to hear he's a successful trader. I appreciate that. All right, I appreciate you all tuning in. Thanks for the likes and all engagement as always. Lots of questions, good questions. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you all soon. Let's see, what do we got next week? I'll be back Monday. Crypto, daily videos, all that good stuff. Weekend videos for members. Courses, again, reminder, comment on this video when it's on YouTube. And I will Sunday pick three course winners. All right. Love you lots. Do good things.